It almost looks like I forgot the strip sander build in this heap of garbage, but that's not the case, because this is officially the third and last episode of how to build a strip sander using just a regular hand mixer as a motor. In the last episode we got most of the technical stuff done, what's left now is to put on a table and a skid plate and basically make it look exactly like the CAD model I designed. So let's get that thing dusted off and get started. In the last episode we also established that the lower wheel needed some tweaking because the belt still doesn't track properly, so that's the first thing we're gonna do. I'm going to loosen these screws, hammer it down a little bit and check to see if it's good yet. If not, I'll just repeat that process until it runs centered on both wheels even if under tension. I actually had to elongate these holes somewhat to make that happen since the wheel needed lowering quite a bit further than expected. So now to make it stay there I'm going to drill two pilot holes for some nails and these are going to ensure that the plywood square ends up on the exact same spot once I glue it on. Good, while that is drying let's make the belt tensioner. You could either make it from hardwood and cut the threads directly into the wood itself or use softwood and insert a screw nut. That's what I'm doing since softwood is just so much easier and cheaper to get than hardwood, even though most of my hardwood was originally firewood, which I got for free. Now I just need to screw it on there and I'm simply going to eyeball it to make it line up with the straight portion of this lever using the square to get it straight as well and then just clamp and screw it down. Next up I'm going to fasten the upper wheel which currently still just slides in and out as it pleases so I'm going to use this tiny little spring which just barely fits over this knob on the end of the shaft and screw it down to the wheel mount. So now I can't really pull out the wheel anymore, it kind of springs back, hence why it's called a spring, and if I turn this knob it still tilts the wheel up and down for the tracking adjustment. And with that out of the way we can turn our attention to the skid plate. To begin with I'm going to cut up this powder coated piece of an old foot pump, Basically, just to get some flat 2.5mm steel bar, the powder coating is of no importance. Then drilling holes and tapping some of them. This also just screws to the vertical beam, I just put it there, flush with this surface here, mark the positioning of these holes, and just screw it down. So, the skid plate. First of all I need to put this straight. This part that I'm referring to as a skid plate is not actually called skid plate. Skid plate is part of a car, but since I don't know what else this slidey slidey metal plate on a belt sander could be called, I'm gonna continue referring to it as a skid plate for the rest of this video. Anyway, since like many other people I don't have the metal working facilities required to bend a nice kit plate from a piece of sheet metal, I'm actually going to use a piece of laminate flooring, that's what I had on the prototype and it did alright. The surface is durable enough for a low power sander like this one and makes things just so much easier. But if you do have access to a sheet metal break, I highly recommend bending kind of a U shape to go around a piece of plywood instead. The only inconvenience I've got with this stuff is that the finish on the back is also smooth and shiny, which means glue won't stick to it unless I remove a very thin layer of the surface. And I'm gonna do that using my trusty old technique of putting a Dremel router bit in the drill press to machine it down by pushing it back and forth under the router bit. Now it fits nicely onto this block, which has got a small ledge on one side to facilitate positioning.
Instead of waiting until that's dry, I could just as well start making the table. As you can see, I'm cutting the table out of the same crappy salvage tip board like I used for the base, and since uncovered particle board edges are about the most ugly and inconvenient thing that can happen, I'm adding some simple spruce edge banding to prevent chipping. That obviously doesn't apply if you use plywood or something else for the tabletop. While the edge banding dries, I'm gonna go ahead and install a skid plate. So we're gonna need two bolts with a washer, and they just slide into these oversized holes and screw into the tapped holes and the steel plate. So now, because of these oversized holes, we've got quite some room for adjustment. So I'm just gonna adjust it here, so it just barely touches the belt. And we're off! I finished up edge banding the tabletop, even put something inside this cutout here, and then suddenly decided I should do the edges of the base as well using some very thin strips, because technically these edges won't be covered up, so the corners would be pretty much endangered. In hindsight, I should have done that right at the beginning, would have been a lot easier, but I didn't, so never mind. Next up is cutting the table mount from some more junk particle board, and actually I leave it 1mm wider than it's supposed to be, because I'm gonna trim it down once I glued on this additional piece, which is gonna help with stability. And then gluing the table mount to the table top is literally the last step before we have a functional sander. I am aware that this design is pretty inconvenient when it comes to belt changes, because you literally always have to remove the table before you can remove the belt. But then again, to be honest, I don't believe anyone ever changes belts on these things that often, and in my case, one belt can literally stay on for years before I change it. So not a big deal if I have to take it apart every two years. And otherwise, at this point, we've got a fully functional sander. We can plug it in, tighten these nuts, and off we go. So this is as far as you'd need to go if you're only out for a functioning machine and don't mind it looking like it's made from garbage. But since it always bothers me if things that are made from garbage also look like they're made from garbage, the next thing we're gonna build is an enclosure to cover up this ugly blue hand mixer, and then it also needs some paint. Yellow paint, obviously. So this is also a good time to talk about the sanding belts that I'm using on this thing, because they are not regular off-the-shelf sanding belts. Actually, they are a ripped one of my regular belt sander sanding belts, cut into 30mm wide strips. Anyway, to make the enclosure, I'm not gonna bore you with cutting rectangles on the table saw. Instead, let's much rather do the traditional finger snap. And here we have all the parts. And now, glue up montage! Not gonna talk you through the process of making the enclosure. It's basically just a very complicated, simple plywood box. And obviously, it also heavily depends on the specific model of your hand mixer.
Well, I may have gone a little bit over the top with the enclosure, but as you can see it's got slots for cooling air to pass through, these are just simple plunge cuts with the table saw, and we've got a big hole for the switch on the side, and it just slides onto the machine like so, and screws on from underneath using mounting holes that don't exist yet. On the other side we've got this rather simple cover, which also just screws on using four non-existent screw holes, and covers up the table mount, the lower wheel, catching all the dust in the process. Now let's go ahead and drill these mounting holes so we can start with the electrics. Conveniently the enclosure also doubles up as a strain relief for the cable because this notch is just a little bit shallower than the cable is thick, so when I screw it down to the base the cable gets clamped in between the two and can't be pulled out anymore. For the electrics I'm first going to bolt this piece of hardwood to the switch to act kind of as an extension so it reaches through the hole in the enclosure, and yes I cannot cheat it a little bit there by specifically choosing a hand mixer that allowed me to simplify things a little bit, so if you cannot do this you could either cut a bigger hole in the enclosure to allow you to reach in with your fingers to switch it on or off, or you could also just set it to the speed you like the most and permanently wire in a proper on-off switch. Now there is one other thing I'm going to add, it's not necessary, you can skip it, but just for good measure I'm going to add an LED. To be precise, a blue LED with the lowest component count possible to make it light on mains power. That is a 100k resistor and a diode for reverse voltage protection. It's all covered in hot glue and for now I'm just gonna put it in there because I still need to paint this thing and I certainly don't plan on painting the LED with it. Then I'll cut the power cord close to the mixer and solder on an extension piece as well as a connector for the LED. Lastly, before I close this thing up I need to put these pieces of styrofoam around the hand mixer to prevent the hot used up cooling air from mixing with the fresh cold one and flowing back to the air inlet inside this box here. That's pretty important if you don't want the hand mixer to overheat, but if you have expanding spray foam it should be real easy, just squirt some in and cut it to shape. If you don't have expanding spray foam, you'll just have to spend some time cutting pieces of styrofoam to shape like I did but the end result should be pretty much the same. Now I can plug in the LED and carefully close it up. There we are. Now just put in the screws. Well, now just assemble the other side and we're done! Plug it in. And we're in business, the LED lights up, now let's switch it on. Let's put it on full speed! Yeah, this thing is really cool. The LED is pretty flickery on camera, that's because it only lights up on one half of the sine wave. Maybe I should have used a few more components to make a proper power supply for it, since this thing is nonetheless going to be part of the backdrop on many videos to come. But I guess it's too late to change my mind now. Never mind, let's cut ahead a few days for the grand reveal of the fully painted machine. It is now, in fact, quite a few days later, I got everything taken apart, painted, put it back together, and now I've got the final product underneath this cloth, so I think it's time for the grand reveal, and ta-da!
As you can see, I did end up changing my mind and made a proper power supply for the LED, so now it doesn't flicker anymore. I totally wouldn't have bothered if I wasn't making these videos, but the flickering on camera was just so annoying I thought, screw it, it is worth a few more salvage components. And now, after I did some minor changes to the CAD model to accommodate for some subtle design changes in the skid plate, as well as the not-so-subtle color scheme, it actually looks exactly like the CAD model. Though before I can officially call this project completed, there is one last thing I need to do. I need to put on these rubber feet I salvaged from an old PC. So just a few noteworthy things before I leave. First of all, I put a little bit of grease between the upper wheel mount and the vertical beam, since varnished surfaces always tend to stick together. I don't know if that was a good idea yet, since I don't know if this varnish gets along with mineral oil on the long run, but I thought it was worth a try. Then if you missed watching me paint this thing, there's a video over on my second channel where I did just that, so go ahead and watch it. Actually, the strip center reveal was quite a bit earlier on the second channel than this video on the main channel dropped, so you might want to be subscribed to the second channel as well. But before you even bother, please make sure to be subscribed to the main channel in the first place, because still over 90% of my viewers aren't subscribed, and if they all were, we would be way past 6k subscribers now. And now to the really important question, money. How much did this thing cost me to build? Well, considering I didn't really buy anything specifically for this project, I might say nothing at all, but factoring in all the things I might have bought somewhere along the line, like the paint, the ball bearings, the wood glue, and even some bolts and screws, half of which were also salvaged, I'll get about $3 at best. Practically all the other materials were either scraps, like the enclosure, or reclaimed, like the crappy particle board from an old couch, or even reused scraps, so the only thing I really paid for was the ball bearings, some bolts, and the LED. And obviously the hand mixer was free since it was broken. Finally, links to everything of interest will be down in the video description as usual, and at some point in the future there will be plans available for this machine, I don't know yet when nor where, building a website is kind of a pain in the ass, but if you need them immediately, hit me up in the comments, I'll send them to you. If anyone ever picks up this design and builds one of their own, please make sure to post it over on r slash technical woodworking and r slash chronic mechatronic, both new subreddits I launched, I would love to see your take on it. Yeah, put it on its own spot in the workshop. Well, there goes my first video series, I'm really happy with the way this machine turned out. It's certainly gonna be useful around here. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one. For the grand reveal. Ta-da! Whoops.